which mm. all that's telling you is that the underlying currency of 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 the country or the or the or the world in the case of the U.S. dollar is, is simply collapsing. And yes, that could, in theory, as you said, Matt, start at any time. And indeed, you could argue that there are signposts. There's no way out of this. The Fed is trapped. If they keep rates higher for longer, that will absolutely implode everything but the dollar. If they pivot, they're going to do that to save the system at the expense of the dollar. We're, we're, we're screwed either way. We're trapped. It's a debt spiral. Well, it's been said many times by many political pundits and economists that the world may be heading towards a monetary and perhaps even political reset. What does this mean exactly? Which assets will be affected? How are our lives and our portfolios be affected? This is the general theme of our discussion with two esteemed economists and investors, people I've spoken to on my show individually. It's the first time I've had the privilege and the honor of bringing both of them together. They are John Butler, Investment Director of South Bank Research, and Matthew Piepenberg, partner of Von Grayers AG. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's great to have you both. I'm looking forward to it. Good to be here. My pleasure, David. You both have had extensive experiences working on Wall Street in past decades. You're now working uh, in the gold management industry. Uh, John has an investment research service, which we can talk about later. Uh, you both have similar views as to where the world is heading. Um, you both think that uh, there are debt crises or perhaps liquidity events uh, imminent on the horizon. And you both think that perhaps some sort of monetary reset uh, will be unfolding uh, sometime in our lifetimes. And so I'm just curious to see how you two uh, interact and and bring out the best in each other. So this will be the point of our discussion today. Let's start with a high level overview of where our world is headed. Matthew, I've spoken to you two months ago in Vancouver uh, uh, live. Uh, people can check out that interview yep. down below. I'll put a link in the description. And you were telling me how a monetary reset is happening. So for those of us who haven't seen that interview, let's start with that. Um, what do you mean by that? What does that look like? Well, it's. I think I'd start with the thirty thousand foot observation that you know we are having a debt crisis, which means a currency crisis. The ripple effects of debt affect literally every asset class and every kind of conversation theme we can. John and I can talk about with you today. I mean, when you look at the ripple effects of debt and you look at the facts of equities and bonds, the recession discussion, the currency issues, the inflation issues, the deflation debate, labor markets, oil, all of these things, and of course, gold trigger off or flow down from uh, this this debt crisis, this unprecedented reality. And, you know, good journalism is often very boring, just like hard economics are often very boring. But these numbers that we're looking at, and John can confirm and have his own views on, I'm sure is very similar, you know, keep it simple, stupid, because I keep saying the simple is very stupid and the stupid is very simple. When you have 120% plus debt to GDP at the home of the world reserve currency is 7% a deficit to GDP, when you've got a congressional budget office pushing for another 20 trillion of treasury issuance in the next 10 years, when you've got a net international investment position that's negative 65, when you've got, as Gunlack said, 212 trillion in unfunded liabilities and 190 trillion in assets, that's a banana republic balance sheet. When our Fed balance sheet has gone from 17 trillion to 34 trillion in a decade, and, um, you know, when we have a trillion dollars in new deficits every hundred days, these things are extraordinary. And although they may seem like numbers on a screen or just data points that we throw out there, they become abstractions. But I think as John and I can talk about in more detail, the, the, the implications of these unprecedented debt levels, these unsustainable debt levels, uh, obviously affect the risk asset markets. Obviously, they affect the credit markets and bond markets, in particular currency markets, and all of that affects the U.S. dollar. And of course, that impacts precious metals in general and gold and silver in particular. So that's my opening thought: that debt is the key stone in the in the in the in the pond, and the ripple effects are everywhere in the macro scene. Uh, John, can you uh, add to that? And I think my additional question to uh, to add color to what Matthew said, if you can address this, is. If this is happening, what Matthew addressed earlier, is it happening soon? Is this something that we should be concerned about imminently in the next 12 to 18 months? Or is this just a general theme of where our world is heading towards over the course of our lifetimes? Well, in the world of investing, David, uh, the fact is there's no such thing as a wrong view, just a wrong time horizon. <laughs> sure, yes. And that's, that's, part of the that's part of the challenge here. Um, look, uh, uh, the fact is, is that uh, the, the, the numbers... That Matt throws out there 
are are indisputable. I mean, those are the numbers. And bizarrely, governments aren't actually embarrassed by them. And you might almost wonder, sometimes they talk as if they're almost proud that their debt market is so large and liquid. And well, gee, maybe that's because it's excessively large and it's beyond your ability to service without resort to devaluation long term. So you, you look at all of this and I mean, it, it, it reminds me of this old Irish proverb when it, when a young man seeking his fortune is walking from some small village in the middle of nowhere, trying to make his way to Dublin, which is by far the largest city in Ireland. And he comes across an old man and and he, he, asks, he asks the old man, uh, excuse me, sir, could you please show me the way to Dublin? And the old man says, well, yes, son, but I wouldn't start from here. And, and I think that's kind of where we've ended up. We've ended up in a place that, if you're honest about it, is not where you'd want to be. And nobody wants to accept responsibility for that. But the fact is, most people aren't even aware that the currency we use, the money we use, the unit of account we use, the store of value we use, that which we, let's face it, mostly take for granted is backed by this unserviceable debt that's been run up, not only by you know, pretty much every country at this point, but by the issuer of the most important global reserve currency. In a way that's never happened before, that is, the global reserve currency prior was always backed by gold. And so there was this natural kind of easy backstop that you knew. You knew that if for some reason a country got into trouble, even the issue of a reserve currency got into trouble. There was this fundamental backing to that. We don't have that today. We are in uncharted waters. Imagine the Titanic hitting an iceberg, but not knowing how deep the Atlantic was. It, it's it's truly unprecedented. And who knows exactly what's going to happen? And sadly, I have to answer your question now. Who knows on exactly what time horizon? Uh, sorry, what, what exactly? I, think sorry, please well, go ahead. I, I was going to say he was saying he's not sure the time horizon. It's true. It's a mug's game to predict a specific moment when things implode, to use sensational terms. But I would argue it's happening in real time right now. The evidence is all around us. I mean, many of your viewers are pretty sophisticated in understanding debt and currency markets and precious metals and, and, and rates and yields. But uh, I look at it again, what's happening in real time with central banks, what's happening in terms of real time with, uh, with the oil trade, what's happening in real time with de-dollarization. These were sensational themes just a couple of years ago, and now they're happening at rapid pace. You can't deny the simple fact that since 2014, the central banks have been dumping U.S. treasuries net and stacking physical gold net. You can't deny that the de-dollarization theme, which became obvious from day one of the sanctions when you weaponized the world reserve currency, was going to be a seismic shift in currency markets and debt markets. That's been happening faster than even I and Grant Williams and Jim Rickards and, 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 and John probably could have predicted two years ago. But it, the writing was on the wall when you weaponize a world reserve currency. And what we're seeing now in the oil trade with the petrodollar, what we're seeing on the COMEX, there are seismic shifts happening already. When you have you know 20% of the petrodollar, basically the oil trade last year outside of the US dollar, when you have 45 BRICS, you know, 45 countries and the BRICS plus countries rising in, in membership, including Saudi Arabia and the UAE, when you have 45 countries doing trade settlements outside of the US dollar, you know, when you see what's happening with the ruble and the yuan and what they're doing with the oil trade, what even Japan is doing now outside of the petrodollar, these are massive implications on the US dollar when you take away that synthetic demand from the petrodollar, when you look at what's happening in the comics market, the delivery is going out by day by day. All of these things are massive. And when you look at central banks dumping U.S. treasuries consistently and stacking physical gold at record levels, these are massive changes right now. You could argue that we're already in real time seeing changes. And when you could argue that when the IMF was talking about CBDC in 2020, the height of the COVID crisis, and what's happening now with the number of countries adopting it or going towards it, or what the BIS is doing, there are major changes happening right now. When it becomes an actual uh-oh moment in the risk asset markets. We can talk about those markets too, but I would say that we're already seeing things that aren't sensational. They're actual, and they may have seemed sensational two years ago, but today uh, the list is long and distinguished. And I think just what's happening in the COMEX and the petrodollar or what's happening with central bank stacking of physical gold is already extraordinary. Um, you 
both mentioned uh, the federal deficit levels. So I'll just uh, present a chart and some figures for the audience here. Um, this is a chart showing the federal deficit level or surplus as a percentage of GDP. It's currently, uh, according to the St. Louis Fed, it's currently at negative 6.1%, which is to say that the deficit level is currently at 6% of the national GDP. Uh, the last time it was this high uh, was 2020 for a very brief period of time during the pandemic. And before that, it was 2008. And we haven't had a deficit this wide uh, as a percentage of GDP before 2008 since World War II. Um, now, I would argue, just looking at recent data, that uh, we've had a deficit, uh, a substantial deficit, ever since the great financial crisis of 2008. And what preceded mm -hmm. after 2009 was the longest bull rally in American stock history. And so it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter for markets whether or not the economy is in a deficit or a surplus. How would you argue or challenge that or even agree with that? Well, I'll let you go first, John, but I've got a lot of thoughts on that, too. Okay. But I just finished. So I'll let John chime in. Sure. Right. Well, 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 in that case, I'll be quick. I mean, look, the United States, as well as most other developed economies, has been in chronic deficit for decades. And that is partly the consequence of what you would call untethered monetary policy. That is, without any gold backing, governments, that is, cent their central banks, can print money as required to finance deficits. And so if it's that easy, then why the hell not? I mean, it seems to be no downside, at least on the time horizon that pertains to most uh, politicians' careers. Uh, you know, they don't care who they leave the bill to in the long term because they're, you know, they're, they're perhaps not even born yet. So that's kind of where we're at. But David, what you point out is kind of astonishing in the sense that this outsized U.S. deficit, unusually large U.S. deficit, is occurring outside of wartime and it's occurring outside of recession. That is new in the American experience. And because the United States is the issuer of the world's reserve currency, that's new in the international monetary experience to have the reserve issuer simply spending and printing money without any cyclical argument to make, without any geopolitical or at least strong geopolitical argument to make. It's almost as if the U.S. is just telling the world, we don't care anymore. We're not trying anymore. We're just going to keep printing and spending and suck it up. And given the geopolitical rebalancing, which, as Matt's already you know, mentioned clearly, has been happening anyway with respect to reserves and trade and whatnot, um, that's an extremely dangerous game of chicken for the United States to be playing today. Yeah, I, I, I joke, and I talked about this with you, David, in, in Vancouver back in January. Look, the markets are Pavlovian, and I'm not trying to be cryptic. If the Fed is hawkish or dovish, the markets are bearish or, or bullish. Uh, I joked often, and it's a cryptic joke, that you could literally have a nuclear bomb go off in Cleveland. It wouldn't send the markets down if the Fed wants to print money or if the Fed wants to support or accommodate the markets. And that's through interest rate policy and balance sheet experiments. They've got two revolvers at the Fed the balance sheet and the interest rates. And, you know, you, you can say, um, you know, if we can centralize capitalism, I think capitalism died in 1913 in general, and probably 2008 in particular, when the Fed stepped in and took away free price discovery completely to support the bond market. The real mandate of the Fed isn't inflation and employment. It's supporting the U.S. Treasury market to keep the yields under control. And they will at some point have to make a decision between supporting the system and sacrificing the currency. Technically, you could nationalize the S&P, which is really just a tech ETF right now. We get into the details of the NASDAQ and the S&P. But you can effectively, just through the carrot of promised rate cuts or eventual inevitable rate cuts, I see, and more QE, which I think is inevitable. Luke Roman would, would agree. Luke Roman is, is super QE is around the corner, just like we saw with the policies of 2018 that led to super QE in 2020. But if you're going to create synthetic liquidity, you're going to debase the currency to save the system, not just the bond market, but this 401k, this nationalized 401k, which is the S&P. So technically, you can do that, but be careful what you ask for, because you'll be measuring your returns in a debased dollar, because the markets, yes, technically, modern monetary theory works. You can keep the markets from ever having a recession that can't be repurchased, or that is a dip that can't be re re reaccommodated. But you'll do that at the expense of your currency. It'll be devastating. So you're measuring your returns 
with a currency that's debased, and you're also going to inevitably lead to inflation because QE is inherently inflationary, and your real return, your inflation-adjusted return, will be comical when you look at the type of actual inflation that will be subsequent to the type of accommodation needed to keep these these Pavlovian markets alive. And, uh, you know, as long as the Fed, and it will inevitably resort to, I think the only reason it's raising rates now is it will have something to lower, and the only reason it's tightening its balance sheet is it'll have something to fatten because it inevitably... The system requires lower rates. It requires artificial support for the bond market, not natural supply and demand. Foreigners aren't coming to our auctions. Foreign central banks aren't buying our IOUs. Uncle Sam will do it through the Fed at the expense of the currency and at the expense of an inflation number that we all know is misreported, underreported, and about to get much, much higher. In the interim, you can have disinflationary forces when you raise interest rates, the Fed funds rates from zero to five and three quarters in a short period of time. That can be disinflationary. An, an inevitable market implosion can be disinflationary, but the end game, since there's no natural buyers of our debt and we live on debt, is going to be QE to the moon and ultimately a higher, higher inflation market, regardless of how the BLS reports it. And and look, it's not just the argument of gold bugs, whether you look at Jeremy Grantham. It's, he, Jeremy Grantham has said, just like Druckenmuller and Paul Singer over at Elliott, these are good funds, that the market is grotesquely overvalued. Um, and he sees a mean reversion to 2500 or 3000 It's shockingly overpriced. And the bubble we're seeing now couldn't come at a worse time. And I'll pause there to see what John thinks. Well, I, I mean, I would agree with you that the stock market is 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 mispriced. But I would say to caveat that slightly or modify that slightly, it's mispriced in valuation terms. That is, look, I mean, if you print enough money, fine, stock prices go up, but it's overvalued in valuation terms and ratio terms, price earnings ratios, uh, EV to EBITDA, price to sales, uh, market cap to GDP or underlying real income growth, whatever you want to call it. That's certainly true. And that's where you bizarrely can make the case, although I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, that the stock market is undervalued. That is, if we're truly going to end up in some hyperinflationary God knows what, mm -hmm. then maybe stocks are still cheap. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, uh, believe me, I, I'm, not, I'm not stating that as a definitive view. I'm just throwing it out there. But, you know, had you been invested in Krupp Industries in Germany in the 1920s, you would have survived the hyperinflation of the 1920s. Why? Mm -hmm. Because Krupp went from strength to strength when the German governments, um, you know, initially under Weimar, but subsequently under a far more nefarious regime, just kept printing money to buy munitions uh, and remilitarize and corrupted very well out of that. So, I, I mean, again, I don't want to draw a, a direct comparison between then and now, but there is there is this 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 case you can make that if, if we're facing this hyperinflationary future, just buy anything that's not bolted down. And for that matter, buy things that are bolted down. Uh, Ludwig von Mises called that uh, the crack up boom. That is, mm -hmm. you get to a point where literally everything goes up in price, which mm -hmm. all that's telling you is that the underlying currency of 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 the country or the or the or the world, in the case of the U.S. dollar, is, is simply collapsing. And yes, that could, in theory, as you said, Matt, start at any time. And indeed, you could argue that there are signposts uh, that it has started already. Just to interject quickly. So we're comparing the U.S. to the Weimar Republic. People have made parallels to countries experiencing hyperinflation today, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Lebanon, so on and so forth. Um, yes, we know the U.S. is non-Zimbabwe. But fundamentally, what is the difference between the U.S. and Zimbabwe in the sense that we are not experiencing hyperinflation to the same extent that some smaller nations are. And I know that the money supply in the U.S. has not grown to the same extent, but people have argued that, well, if the money supply has grown by that much since the pandemic, why haven't we seen, you know, 50% annualized inflation? Why hasn't it only been 9%? So on and so forth. Yes. Well, the main difference is we're the home of the world reserve of currency. The Venezuela and Weimar were not. We can, it's, you know, that famous quote by John Connolly, the exorbitant privilege, you know, being the world reserve currency is it's our currency, your problem, your problem for the rest of the world. We can export our currency, our inflation to you. We can 
we can do what we want with interest rates in our balance sheet and you can follow through, which is why we saw a guilt crisis in the UK following our rate hike process, because we can afford to play with rates because we have this exorbitant privilege. I would say today that Connolly's famous quote in the 60s or 70s, our currency, your problem is now our currency, our problem. Because what's the, the problem is, unlike in the 70s or 80s, we're looking at $34 trillion in public debt and well over $100 trillion in combined household, public, and corporate debt. So we are going to have to somehow pay for that debt by debasing our currency, which is what von Mises, von Mises said. Every debt crisis leads to a currency crisis. You know, Reinhardt and Rogoff said this. David Hume said this in the 1800s, in the, in the seven, 18th century, in the 1750s. Ernest Hemingway said this in the 1940s. You can't get a, you know, whether you're looking at Reinhardt, Rogoff, David Hume, or von Mises, you can't, you, you can't get everything from. There's always a cost, and this this notion that we can live on on debt without a consequence is childish. And, and, and the question of well, when does it break? Well, it, it breaks when I think we've confused the economy with the markets. And I think the fact that our markets are so narrow and being led by the magnificent five, not even the magnificent seven, I think, you know, markets expand and contract on net income. And when net income is 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 in there are times I saw it in the dot com bubble. You certainly saw it pre Lehman, John. You were there in 206 to 208. You know it well as anyone. I certainly saw it as a trader. You know, most bubbles start on fundamentals. I looked at Lucent, I looked at Qualcomm, I looked at um, you know stocks that I was trading in those days. But these are foreseeable. 1929, 1972, 2000. These were foreseeable things. We've seen recent bubbles in ARKK, Zoom, Peloton, uh, Moderna, Revion, Coinbase, even IPOs, which have pretty much dried up. Um, you know, the current the current magnificent five to me is really no different than cisco lucent microsoft or qualcomm those were not necessarily bad companies just overvalued companies i've seen nvidia's balance sheet and its net profits expand beautifully i'm not saying it's a bad company it's just in my opinion it won't be able to manage that net income expansion forever uh these bubbles always start on fundamentals fomo kicks in and then there's insider trading towards the end and then eventually they can't contain those net margins and then there's a sell-off and a lot of people i know on wall street are going long but their biggest trade is going to be going short when net income margins contract instead of expand and that's what leads to a crisis in the market and i think the biggest force that's ignored in market analysis is mean reversion and that's what jeremy grantham at gmo is talking about timing that is difficult but just look for a contraction in net income nvidia you know, had a huge move in 21, and then they had a, a loss in 22, and then a 19 billion profit in 23. So, so again, it's not like Qualcomm or Lucent, a bad company. It's just an overpriced company, or in my opinion, overvalued company. But I think the difference is when this market bubble pops, unlike the subprime crisis or the dot-com crisis, 2000 and 2008, we're on the backdrop of a global recession. You know, I'm in Europe, and, and John's in Europe too, and I've spend a lot of time in Germany. Germany's in recession. Its economic finance minister says it's dramatically bad. Its PMI manufacturers at depressionary levels. The DAX is up, but the economy is down. Uh, UK is in recession. China's in recession. Korea's in recession. America, in my opinion, is in recession. just hasn't been officially announced. So when the Magnificent Five implode, there's no good narrative left. This is particularly different than 08 or 2000 in the subprime bubble, the dot-com bubble, because we have a multipolar dysfunctional economic situation at the macro level, and this bubble in the in the S and P and the Nasdaq is the last good piece of news we have right now. Yeah, Josh, go ahead, please. Well, well, again, I can't I can't really disagree with any of that. I think that the the way to to sort of understand what's happening is that in an environment where where debt's out of control and money's becoming unstable, it's difficult to predict precisely what the stock market will do. And indeed, when most of the action, as Matt just explained, is concentrated in not even the magnificent seven, but then but the magnificent five, which you know, at some point you can't use the word magnificent when the numbers keep getting smaller. But in any event, <laughs> if you look at everything in gold terms, things begin to make more sense. Yes, stocks are expensive, but if you discount them in gold terms rather than dollar terms somewhat less expensive, still expensive, but less expensive. And indeed, I would argue that if you look at lots of things in gold terms, they make more sense. The oil gold ratio is hardly out of line with what we've seen uh, in all the decades post Bretton Woods. And indeed you can generalize to, oil, uh, to commodity prices generally in gold. The fact is the real economy, the real economy when viewed in gold terms still makes sense. What does not make sense 
is this hyper financialized, hyper leveraged, hyper over indebted financialized economy backed increasingly, if not 100 percent now by central banks and governments directly through all the various QE and other programs right. that have right. gone on in recent years. Right. That's what doesn't make sense. That's the outlier. Yeah. And when you realize that, then you have an idea where we're going. There needs to be a fundamental repricing of all things financial, mm -hmm. almost everything, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis all things not financial, or at least to the extent they are financial. They're very, very explicitly backed by real assets, unencumbered by debt and leverage. Mm -hmm. That's where we're going. That's the reset, if you want to call it that, that will have to occur at some point in the future. Now, I'd like to think we can get there and get through that peacefully. Sadly, some of the things happening in the world today uh, lead me to believe it might not be peaceful and it might be very disorderly, but happen it will. Okay. Yeah. I, this, I, like this. I was going to say, Dave, this goes to your very original question, though, when, you know, again, none of us know the when. <laughs> But when you talk about liquidity is the grease for all engines of financial markets and that liquidity is key, when you run out of that grease, the engine starts to smoke and the and the, the financial truck pulls it off to the side of the road. To, to John's point, we're running out of backdoor tricks. We're going to have to go to front door unlimited QE, in my opinion, or some type of reset or some type of blame it on global warming, blame it on Putin, blame it on Martians, blame it on something to justify the mistakes and sins of our central bankers and politicians who've been living beyond their means. But if you look in the last four years, five times we've tried to create liquidity through the back door, whether it was the TGA, the Treasury General Account, the BTFP program, the reverse repo markets, the short end issuance, now the ISDA, the Swaps and Derivatives Association is begging the Fed to allow them to use unlimited leverage to buy U.S. Treasuries. The Fed was guaranteeing the too big to fail banks their, their U.S. Treasuries marked to mark to par instead of mark to market to give them more liquidity. All these tricks we've been using to avoid the obvious, which is just print more money through a mouse clicker at the Eccles building or pivot to lower rates, which Powell will do this year. I don't think he'll do it six times. He's already said he'll do it three or two times. I'm saying we are running out of backdoor liquidity. We're going to have to come up with front door liquidity. That's going to be embarrassing. Or we have, you know, to John's point, something worse. We could have war and we could have finger pointing and we could have distraction. And most importantly, and most inevitably, and we're seeing in real time right now, more centralization, because that to me is the real fear. Let's discuss that real quick. You brought that up. Uh, that was my next topic, the Fed. OK, so, John, uh, how many times do you think the Fed would cut if you believe they would pivot this year? Matthew said fewer than what the market expected. I think that's quite likely now that we're seeing energy prices bounce, right? O oil's up quite strongly over the past few weeks. But what you also see, if you look closely, uh, gas is up, although from a low level, but it's up. Uh, coal, uh, let's not discount coal. The fact is, for roughly half the world's economy, coal is still one of the single most important inputs to base power generation. Uh, so you, you, you put that all together. And when you realize that energy is the single biggest cost input into agricultural production, that is food, you've now got energy and food having bottomed. The disinflation appears to be over. It's not clear it's going to turn into outright inflation, but the base effect in of itself is going to make it very, very difficult for the inflation numbers to keep coming down between now and the end of the year. And that will make it more difficult for central bankers to feel comfortable cutting interest rates. However, that's kind of business as usual. What if business isn't as usual? What if there is a fundamental further, and I stress further, decline in demand for the world to hold the debt of the major developing countries, including the United States? The fact is, the trend has been in place for years. Matt mentioned a few figures that previously supposedly natural, I would say unnatural, appetite for that debt was already in decline. What if it remains in decline? The twin trends of disinflation ending and returning to perhaps mild energy powered general inflation on the one hand, and a continued decline in the global appetite for the debt issuance of the US and other major developed importing countries 
That continues. Real interest rates are not going to decline. Debts will therefore become even more difficult to service in real terms. And that could, I stress good, accelerate the end game. And yes, would have an impact, therefore, on the timing of what we're talking about here. Matthew, just to bounce off what John said uh, just now, if real interest yeah. rates will not decline, well, first of all, if you do you agree with that? And second, if real interest mm -hmm. rates will not decline, wouldn't that be a major headwind for gold, given their historical uh, negative correlations? Well, first of all, let me, let's, let's go to the rates, then we'll talk about gold. I think rate, first of all, well, gold, I think, is disconnected from its typical correlations. Rates up, rates down, dollar strong, dollar weak. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I don't think those things matter anymore. We can get into that in more detail. In terms of the viewer's interest in what will the Fed do this year, again, we're all, first of all, we have to be very sad that we have to predict what the Fed does to decide what's going to happen to our financial futures. That's how centralized the markets are. That's how centralized... Uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ are um, and other markets that follow. You know, when you and I met again in Vancouver, there was there were giddiness about six rate cuts this year. Well, we're already now at the end of Q1 and it still hasn't been a rate cut. I think there will be, but probably two. Powell just said last week there's going to be three. So we only have a few. We have six more meetings left. I don't think it'll be at the next meeting. So we're all speculating here. I'm not guaranteeing anything. Sure. But here's why I think rate cuts are inevitable, at least two, probably in September. Uh, maybe July, maybe June, but more likely in July and September. Uh, in, in short, in, you know, short of caveat, if there's a market crisis tomorrow, you'll see rate cuts right away. But the real reason I see rate cuts as inevitable is because Uncle Sam can't afford higher rates for longer. Jeffrey Gunlek has reminded us that bond markets can't stand higher for longer. We're repricing. $8.9 trillion in U.S. Treasuries this year. The S&P has got $740 billion in those zombie companies that have to reissue debt in 2024, another $1.000,000 in 2025. They can't afford higher for longer. And so, and because as Larry Leopard says, you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. If you're going to have to issue more debt, and the U.S. will issue more debt, the CBO has told us they're going to issue at least $20 trillion in the next 10 years. You can't do that at higher rates. You have to bring the rates down because Uncle Sam can't even afford his own interest rate policy. So I see a rate cut as the realpolitik of our debt levels. Powell is not Volcker. Volcker could raise rates in the seven in late seventies or early eighties because our corp our, our public debt was less than a trillion, not thirty four trillion. He doesn't have the same tools. He's absolutely trapped. So again, he'll save the system by debasing the currency. He will reduce rates so that Uncle Sam can afford their own interest expense. We're not going to cut entitlements. We're not going to cut deficit, I mean, military spending. And we've got a Social Security and Medicare program that is already going to be broke by, two, you know, in, in, by 2030. And David Stockman, you know, who's from my hometown, is a congressional member of, member of Congress and a member of, this, of, of Reagan's staff, saw this coming years ago. So I think rate cuts are a realpolitik. Um, I think they're inevitable. In terms of the impact on gold, yeah. maybe I'll pause there, but I think, uh, yes, I don't look at the traditional headwinds and tailwinds for gold. I think the real argument for gold is is a little bit more amorphous. Maybe you know you could say poly, you know Pollyannish. But the simple thing is, it goes to trust, which is hard to quantify empirically. But trust in the U.S. Treasury has completely changed, especially since the sanctions two years ago. And I think the trust in the U.S. Treasury is the main reason that the trust in the U.S. dollar is going to be weakening. Let me just add to that, and we'll come back to gold. Uh, I'll let whoever wants wants to take this one next. Um, respond. The annual issuance of U.S. Treasury, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal here, the annual issuance of U.S. Treasuries has exploded, nearly doubling since the pandemic began. The government sold a record $23 trillion worth in 2023 alone, and few think the spree is going to slow down, given the widespread expectation that government spending will continue to rise regardless of who wins November's elections. What is the immediate market impact, if any, of this issuance uh, that has progressed through the last year? Mm -hmm. uh, John, Look, you go I mean, first? all all prices, all prices are set by supply and demand, and and that's true about Treasury prices. My point that the U.S. was not going to enjoy, and would not have the option of enjoying, in my opinion, a sustainable drop in the in effective real interest rates for financing its debt, has to do more with the demand side. That is, there's been this natural, again, natural in quote, source of global demand for treasuries for decades that the U.S. takes for granted, just figuring that everybody needs dollar reserve assets. But if that game is over, then 
if the U.S. continues to issue, that is, increase the supply, but the demand isn't there, then the effective real interest rate rises. Now, the Fed can step in and try to control that, and indeed, they already do, and they'll continue to do so. But they'll have to do exponentially more to keep that real interest rate down if there is this shift in the global demand function for U.S. debt, which I believe has already started. I think it started years ago, actually. But as Matt said, has arguably gone through a step change in the function as a result of the sanctions regime, which causes everyone not only to question the price of treasuries in future, that is, whether to buy and hold, but the very liquidity and fungibility of treasuries in future as a result of possible sanctions extended on who knows who, who does who knows what, who somehow offends the United States on who knows what future policy that is either made by Congress or the president through executive order, who who, who knows what. The fact is the U.S. has become, this is, this is, this is a big statement, but appropriate in my opinion. The U.S. has become something of a global loose cannon, but it's not just a cannon the same size as the other cannons on the ship. It's the single biggest cannon of all, and it's loose. And if it fires in the wrong direction at the wrong time, in the wrong circumstances, it doesn't just you know cause damage. It literally sinks the ship. Mm. And, and and that's what we're dealing with now. So that that that's just to clarify my comments there. Yeah, and to your point, David, on gold too and markets, but gold, look, again, um, and, and you could spend hours on gold and we could try and do it in 30 seconds, but again, keep it simple, stupid, at 30,000 feet. It's not that gold gets stronger, currencies get weaker, including the home of the world reserve currency, including the US dollar. And so when you look at the US dollar and its loose cannon policies and its loose cannon geopolitics, its loose cannon monetary policies, its loose cannon social policies, its loose cannon weaponization of everything from the media to race, to sexuality, to gender, to the, to pretty much law has been completely loose cannon for the last five to 10 years in particular. But look, if if you understand that gold doesn't get stronger, currencies just get weaker, then you go back to these ripple effects. If you look at debt, look at the debt, we can go, we spend 20 minutes on debt, we could spend 20 minutes on currency, we could spend 20 minutes on rates, we could spend 20 minutes on central bank buying or dis, or not buying of US treasuries. You could spend 20 minutes on de-dollarization and what the BRICs are doing to go around the marginal line of the US dollar instead of going through it, they're just going around it. You could spend 20 minutes on the oil markets, you could spend 20 minutes on the COMEX, but all of those things are seismically shifting right now in real time that affect the US dollar and therefore a massive tailwind for gold, which is why gold is reaching all time highs despite traditional headwinds. And I think, you know, and then you've also got the fact that you've got the Shanghai Gold Exchange creating its own moving average for gold outside of London and New York. You've got what's happening in the petrol dollar markets. And you've, you know, what's also fascinating is you can get guys like, you know, Peter Schiff and Larry Leopard arguing about Bitcoin or gold. You can get me and Brent Johnson arguing about whether the DXY goes higher or lower, but we all agree that gold's going higher, regardless of these different views, regardless of these different ideas. And I think you also have to look at history. You know, 1971, we got off the gold standard. What did we do in 1973? We created a petrodollar to create synthetic demand for that dollar to keep the Gulf states in love with our dollar. Well, that's also breaking down. And the COMEX was created in 1974 to put a permanent boot to the neck of the gold prices, natural supply and demand. The COMEX is having real pains. So there's all these things happening right now. And you yeah. can spend a lot of time on each of these things, but they all are massive implications for the gold uh, price just and to, the U.S. dollar. Uh, we'll, we'll finish off on gold in just a minute, but just to narrow down on rates, um, and we'll finish off on interest rates mm -hmm. here. Uh, Matthew, uh, if you look at a longer term chart of the 30-year uh, treasury yield, uh, so it peaked in, uh, in the early 80s at 15%, just above 15%. Uh, it was on a steady decline, a multi-decade decline, troughing around 2021 at uh, just above 1.4%. It's since in the last three, four years, since 2020, it's been on a steady uh, ascent back up to where we currently are, which is above 4%. Is this ascent mm -hmm. going to continue? In other words, is this the yeah. start of a multi-decade uh, retracement back up to 15%, do you think? Well, again, yields, price, bond stress. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying this because I'm not the biggest fan of Larry Summers, whether I was wandering around Harvard Yard or dealing with uh, some of his policies. 
Uh, even Larry Summers came out, I think, in a tweet last week saying, look, if you, and you've, you've talked to the guys at Shadow Stats, those are great interviews, but even Larry Summers says if you use the methodology, the housing methodology pre-1983, we're looking last year at peak inflation of 18%. So even if, the, even if you believed in the long long end of the yield curve giving you yield, you're going further and further on the risk branch for crappier and crappier yield, but you're still, in my opinion, not looking at BLS, bogus inflation reporting. You're still not beating actual inflation at those rates. You're actually getting a negative real return. Um, so I don't know you know, how you really can look. I like Luke Roman. I don't know how anyone looks beyond the 10 year for any kind of yield. That's the problem. When you look at actual inflation, where are you really getting yield? Now, gold's a pet rock. It doesn't give you any yield. And yet people are stacking that treasuries. So you're getting past this inflation debate because we can't even agree on what inflation is. And I, I, I and I'm not trying to be cryptic, but I, I really believe the Bureau of Labor Statistics, whether they're talking about labor data or inflation data, like Bernanke, they deserve a Nobel Prize. But like Bernanke, I think they deserve one in fiction, not in economics, because I think the data and it sounds sensational is bogus. But, you know, as that famous European commissioner said, Jean-Claude Juncker, when the data is bad, we literally lie. And I think the inflation air today is a complete farce. I really do. To your question. If we get 15% yields on the 30-year, what's the actual inflation rate versus the reported inflation rate? And what kind of demand collapse would that inquire? And this is where I talk about with my debates with Brent Johnson and the U.S. dollar and how it implies we all agree that gold is a good end game. But if there's less and less demand for the U.S. Treasury, that means there's less and less you know, price push. That means the bond prices should be going down and yields should be going up. And technically, you could see higher yields in the long end of the curve because there's less and less interest by foreigners. Again, I think the Fed can solve that problem by creating synthetic demand to keep those bonds uh, higher, uh, artificially loved for otherwise unloved asset. But that's at the expense of the currency as well that you measure that return in. So you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. The real problem is our currency is being neutered and debased to monetize our debt. There's no way out of this. The Fed is trapped. If they keep rates higher for longer, that will absolutely implode everything but the dollar. If they pivot, they're going to do that to save the system at the expense of the dollar. We're, we're, we're screwed either way. We're trapped. It's a debt spiral. Well, John, let's talk it's about it's, gold. Let's, let's 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 start by talking about gold. And I'll start with John. Um, over the course of the last couple of months, we've seen stocks reach new all-time highs. Bitcoin has recently reached new all-time highs, like we've talked about extensively. Rates have continuously gone up. Um, silver has lagged behind. Gold mining stocks have been lagging. Why is gold up? It just seems to be the sore thumb of the uh, of, of the of the hand here. Can you ascribe a reason as to why gold is up in this current environment? And by the way, inflation's been coming down. Uh, if you believe the BLS numbers at all, the trend, even shadow stats, the trend has been showing a decline. So why is gold up? I think gold's coming back from a period of having actually underperformed. I, I think there were a, a number of reasons for that that were related to uh, uh, l l almost artificial demand for, for U.S. US assets. There was a, there was a general flight into US assets following the start of the Ukraine war. The dollar itself has benefited from that. Dollar assets have benefited from that. Look at relative valuations of the US stock market vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Uh there I mean that divergence is arguably as high as it's ever been depending on how you choose to define it. And and so Gold was kind of overlooked, you could say, based on this idea, which which Matt and I clearly both disagree with, that the U.S. remains the same sort of safe haven it always was. I, I don't believe it is. And indeed, I think that all of this talk about, oh, gee, the Fed is going to have to cut rates at some point. Oh, the U.S. is running this unusually high deficit, given that it's neither at war nor in the official war, uh, nor in recession. Uh, you know, the U.S. economy is just not looking as relatively strong as it used to. And the dollar itself is no longer the currency it used to be. It's now at risk of poor liquidity and perhaps poor fungibility in future if the U.S. continues to weaponize it uh, going forward from here. So gold had a lot of reasons to recover, and it is recovering now. That said, if you take a look at a lot of fundamental ratios, gold versus the U.S. money supply, gold versus the U.S. debt supply, or you can globalize those terms if you prefer, but then gold trades in dollars. So it, it, yeah, it, it, that's an open question how you choose to measure those ratios. Gold's cheap. Seriously, gold is way cheaper 
than it was when the U.S. suffered the stagflation and severe recession of the early 1980s. It's significantly cheaper. And yet the debt burdens are higher. The leverage is higher. The financial system is that much more unstable. Geopolitically, things are worse now than they were then, which is, you know, kind of takes some, some really stretch of your historical imagination. We all thought at the end of the Cold War, the world, the world would become a safer place. Obviously, we were wrong. So anyway, gold was cheap. It's still cheap. And if you ask me, gold at five figures is going to be required to even begin to get it back to where it logically belongs based on quantitative, that is the ratios, as well as qualitative factors, that is the geopolitical environment. So in my opinion, gold is just beginning a, a truly historical bull market. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to yeah, read I totally you. agree. I totally agree with John because yeah. I think another ratio that's very important to keep in mind, again, not sensational, historical, fact-based numbers. We can all have our own opinions. We can't make up our own facts. Roughly, right now, gold, physical gold is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 of all global financial assets. So it's not the most discussed asset class on Wall Street, although our clients from 90 different countries would disagree. They're pretty sophisticated. But the 40-year mean for gold is around 2% of global financial assets. It's been as high as six, but if you just stick to the 40 year mean, that means you'd have a four X increase in demand as, as, as gold becomes more important and his trust in the U S dollar and U S treasury gets weaker visibly and obviously so in the current geopolitical and political backdrop and financial backdrop. So even that uh, is something you have to consider about when, in, you know, in, in terms of all time highs, then, you know, the gold has reached all time highs despite quote unquote headwinds. Um, but in real terms versus real terms, I think the real high was in 1980 when gold was at 850. In inflation adjusted terms, that was the all time high. And in inflation adjusted terms today, that would put gold right now around 3,000 as the next target price. And to John's point, I think this is just chapter one of the market for gold. It's going to get much, much higher. But again, be careful what you ask for because when gold is at five, 10 or higher thousand, you know, those type of thousands of dollars, the cost of everything else is going to be higher. And the world in which we live in will be more and more destable as we, again, as the world dysfunctional as it is, slowly but surely moves away from the what was the iconic America to what is now a debt-soaked America. And I'm an American and I still love this country. I just don't recognize it. It doesn't, rec it doesn't resemble the free price discovery, the free markets that I studied and believed in. I think what we have is a feudalistic society where the vast majority of the wealth and the vast majority of the stock market wealth has gone to a small minority, including myself. That's not That does not bode well for society. It does not bode well for politics. It ultimately means more centralization, the signs of which are literally everywhere. And I think what we're going to see is when the X really hits the fan, the morons who put us into this uh, hole that we're in are going to blame everything but the bathroom mirror, as I've said many times. And what's even more dangerous is the possibility that war and inflation and the debasement of the currency will be the excuse rather than completely drunken financial and monetary policy. On that note, there's been a trend of countries repatriating their gold. Um, again, uh, people have written yeah. in, in the press that this is because geopolitical tensions have been, uh, have been heightening. Are there any other reasons for this? I'll let uh, whoever wants. Well, to... I saw in Switzerland, yeah. I'll just say real quickly, in, in Switzerland where I work, you've seen in 2024 the highest export to the GCC countries, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, these, you know, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, these, these oil countries. They're taking gold delivery at a major level right now. Swiss gold exports to 10-year uh, highs already in 2024. Um, again, it's my strong belief this goes to a larger conversation on the petrodollar that unlike Libya and unlike um, – you know, Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein in Iraq, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, whose currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't want to see the U.S. dollar collapse tomorrow. But I think the fact that you're seeing gold being stacked all over the world, and in particular in the Persian Gulf states, is because eventually, as we're already seeing, there is a slow but obvious move away from the pet dollar, the oil price is a heck of a lot less volatile when it's gold-based, even when the U.S. dollar was gold-backed. And I think the the, the petrodollar in, in 2024 isn't what it was when Kissinger and Volcker were raising rates in, in, two, in, in 1973. I think this move of central banks, this move of the GCC countries taking on more physical gold, to me, as I've said many times, it's like you don't need to be a military genius. When you see armies moving towards your border, you better get defensive. When you see gold being moved and repatriated, outside of switzerland into the gulf states and out and when you see central bank stacking gold and dumping uncle sam's ious 
they're preparing for a quote unquote battle. They're preparing for something different. And this has been happening ever since we weaponized what was supposed to be a neutral reserve currency in 2022. Uh, John, would you like to respond to that? Well, I can't disagree with that. And, and indeed, there's been this steady flow of physical gold from West to East for many, many years, even before the war in Ukraine, even before the sanctions and the weaponization. It's been a steady trend that that I, I'm not alone in having observed. The fact is, we're in a bit of a bubble in the Western world. We, we've been so prosperous for so long, and our financial system has become so, well, I mean, some would call it sophisticated. Uh, I, I would call it uh, sort of atomized in the sense that we no longer really understand how money's created. We no longer understand how that money uh, flows through the system. Credit's not just credit anymore. It's derivative one, derivative two, derivative three. And to be fair, central banks themselves and even the Bank of International Settlements, if you read between the lines, they're at some combination of throwing up their hands and, and and not really understanding the risks in the system anymore. It's it's almost like they become a sort of a, a a group of just let's try to come up with excuses beforehand next time when it all blows up. And indeed, recent statements by the the chairman of the BIS in Basel, uh, Karstens uh, of Mexico. Um, he he, I mean, some of his recent statements, he's kind of saying. We just know the system is now a bit too over leveraged over this, over that, but we can't tell precisely where. Uh, that's kind of where we've ended up. It's not a good place. And and I think that one of the realities of, of the world that we live in now is that it, the authorities are, it's got to the point where they pretend to know what's going on. They pretend to be in control, but they really don't. And I'm not sure where you come back from that. I, I, I really don't. Uh, and, and yes, the argument for, again, owning gold is only old and stronger when you realize that's the sort of environment in which you live. Okay, I, I think. Yeah, Augustine Carson's physically and, and intellectually reminds me of another character from a bad movie like Klaus Schwab does. Like they're right out of central casting. But again, in, in this, we, we could need a whole other episode. One of the final implications, I think, of all of this, I think you could argue coincidental or planned implosion because they are completely out of control the debt levels are out of control the currency markets are shifting the the the, the seismic shifts that are happening post sanctions and post debt levels are leading towards what i think is the end game for all debased currencies all debt crises throughout history from ancient rome to today is more centralized control and more extreme political and financial controls and and john you've talked a lot about cbdc and the implications behind the good narrative and the bad narrative the real the real sad story behind what is supposedly a more efficient payment system. I think that is another, we won't have time for today, but I think ultimately you could argue a good crisis next couple of years would be the perfect red carpet for more CBDC, which is already adopted in 11 countries, 114 are going for it. And it was initially issued by the People's Bank of China. So if China autocracy centralization, its finest can do it, I don't see why the West and the US can't do it either, because that's, I think, where we're headed. And that's very, very sad. And that's a whole other discussion. Uh, tell us where we can find your work. We'll wrap it up here. So John, uh, tell us about uh, South Bank. Well, South Bank Investment Research is the largest independent provider of investment research in the United Kingdom. We have roughly 50,000 clients and we provide research of all types, not only about gold, not only about stocks, but you know, interest rates, portfolio construction, currencies, you name it. Our website, uh, if you're interested in learning more, is www.southbankresearch.com. We also operate a website called Fortune and Freedom, which does also represent our views, but tends to stray into the political a little bit from time to time, uh, not merely offering investment thoughts and commentary. Okay, where uh, I'll put the website link down below. Uh, Matthew, tell us a little bit about uh, Von Grayer's. Yeah, Von Greer is obviously we are the largest private gold service outside of the banking system for high net worth clients. We've got a vault in an undisclosed location. It's the safest private gold vault in the world in the Swiss Alps. We have another vault in Zurich. We have a vault in Singapore. We also have logistics that can put physical gold anywhere in the world. 
We strongly believe, obviously, in the why gold, but equally, if not more important, is how to own gold, which means not at a commercial bank, not in an ETF, and probably not in a safe deposit box outside of the jurisdiction legally of your own country. So we really are servicing sophisticated precious metal investors. We have clients from over 90 countries, um, and we are, you know, we're in it as a wealth preservation, not a speculation tool. It was founded by Egon von Greyers, my von Greyers, my colleague and partner, uh, over 25 years ago. And we can be found at von Greyers, von Greyers gold or vg.gold or goldswitzerland.com. And all of our articles and interviews are posted there. And our thoughts on uh, not just why gold, but how to own gold are expanded in more detail there. Okay. I didn't ask you gentlemen about Bitcoin. Uh, maybe we'll save that for another discussion. Uh, I figured you might have the same reaction. But uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a great talk uh, uh, for the last hour. And uh, I'm sure the audience appreciates it. So I, I appreciate both of you being here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks, John. Thank you, David. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.